Even though it's hot outside, it's comfortable inside. <laughs> it was hot last night when I was trying to pump up the uh, mattress that I was sleeping on. Very hot. I sweated like crazy. But then the cool shower felt so nice afterwards. And, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm used to this. When I travel extensively in Africa, there's, uh, this is a luxury to have running water, you know. You don't have to run and get it. It runs by itself. <laughs> we used to live in one mission, mission in Ruesi. It was actually right on the border of, right on the, right on the equator. The equator run, ran through the mission. And uh, it was 6,300 feet elevation. Even, there were often nights when, it, when a fire felt good in the fireplace. Okay, you don't think of Africa being cold, you know, but it was cool up there. Not cold like here, but cool. And the homes aren't heated. So people at 50 degrees, oh, Ooh, <laughs> they're shivering. They put their jackets on 50 degrees because they're not used to the temperature. And uh, so we would, we would uh, have our fire in the fireplace and so on. But we didn't have running water. We had to run and get it. We, we actually hired people to do this. People would go down to a spring, down the mountain, and they would fetch water, and then they would bring it up and put it into the, into the catchment. So that we had water, but, it, but we didn't have connected, it was not connected to uh, our source. You had to bring the water and put it in there, or some of the water came from the rain, so, rain source. But, uh, so it's a luxury to have, to have running water, even if it's cool. In fact, cool water actually feels good. Most of the time, I don't, I don't heat the water in Africa when I travel. I just take cool bath because it's not that cold. It's refreshing. Well, our topic today is invitations by royalty are never declined. We'll get to the story at the end. I'll hold you in suspense till the end. A very exciting story about when my parents were invited to meet the Queen Mother of England when she came to Africa back in the early 60s for the for the dedication of the Kariba Dam project in Zambia, which was at that time called Northern Rhodesia. Invitations by royalty are never declined. I'd like to introduce you to my family. Just yesterday, we had a new addition. Our, our eighth grandchild was born yesterday afternoon. And uh, so we have eight grandchildren now, four children, eight grandchildren, Three, uh, two son-in-laws and one more in Jan on January the 2nd. We'll make three son-in-laws and one daughter-in-law. So we have the small Goodwin tribe now. Small Goodwin tribe. We're developing our own tribe. <laughs> and uh, what a blessing they are. All of them are involved in the church, and all of them are committed Christians. So we appreciate that. On the left, on, on your right, rather, the far right, Pastor Luis Mancebo, he's a Spanish-speaking pastor, Spanish pastor from, from Dominican, but now he's in New York and he, he, he speaks in a multilingual, he pastors a multilingual church there, multi-ethnic, not, not multilingual, but multi-ethnic uh, church. He wanted to show that it's not just because you're a Spanish pastor that churches grow, but that it's because you focus on evangelism. Amen. And so the first year he was there in this 500 members church, they baptized, I think, 43 people into the family of God. You see, it's not, it's not so much what ethnics you are. It is the focus of your life. Is your focus on sharing the love of Jesus with others? Next to him is our daughter, Heather. She's a physician. Then there are three little boys there. And then leaning up against the tree is our daughter, Jennifer. She's going to be getting married uh, in, on the 2nd of January. That's her daughter, Betsy Bain. My wife and I, Joanne, is my wife of almost 50 years, 49 years. In August next year, will be 50 years. And then our son and his wife standing. And they are the parents of our latest grandchild, Emma, born yesterday afternoon in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then sitting down there is uh, my daughter and her family, her husband and her two children and the little baby there. So this is our small tribe. But you know, it's, but for the grace of God, I would not be. 
That was my car on October 7 last year. I had been down to Uchi Pines. I had gone over to see my daughter in Mississippi. Then I came up Tennessee and I came home and I, I missed the, last, the exit on top of the mountain, 299. And I went, in, and I went into a overlook for where, the, where it's overlook with a memorial of those who have died working on the, on, the, on the roads, right there near top of the mountain. And I evidently went to sleep. I don't remember anything. I was in a coma for some time. But I'm thankful to be alive. I think God still has a purpose for me. I'm going to take you, I'm going to combine two mission trips. And I hope that today, if a fire is not yet burning in your heart for missions, that it will begin to burn. That's my job. I'm recruiting for the kingdom of God and for the mission work that needed to be done around the world. I grew up in Africa as a child, went there. I turned seven on the boat going over from New York to Beirut on the far side of Africa, Mozambique. It took us six weeks and two days from New York to Beirut. We came down along the United, eastern part of the United States, down to Miami, across to Ascension Island. Then we stopped at different ports around the bottom of Africa. Finally, we got to Beirut. And as children, you know, I was just, I turned seven on the boat. My sister was, was uh, three, almost four. My brother was four years older than me. The three of us, we were, we were expecting as soon as we got to Africa, we we're going to see animals and, and African huts and all these things, but big cities, we were all disappointed, you know, what's the matter with this? We come all this way and there's no African huts, no, but we saw plenty of African huts after that, and we saw plenty of animals in the game parks, but we were disappointed because our idea was the African was some place that there's only animals and things like that, you know, but you know, many of you have the wrong, wrong picture of Africa too. I know because I've talked to some of you. You think Africa is a dangerous place. You know, it's not as dangerous as Chicago. It's not as dangerous as Baltimore. It's not as dangerous as Washington, D.C. Africa is a wonderful place. If I can't convince you after today, I don't know what I can do. I just don't do my, don't do my best. I, want, I need your help in Africa, you see, because God's given us a plan to reach the youth of Africa and to recruit, train, equip, mobilize, and empower an army of youth. You know, this is how Ellen White, the messenger to our church, has told us God's work would be finished. And she says, if you look in that little brochure that I gave you, she says right here, she says, with such an army of workers as our youth rightly trained might furnish, how soon the message of a crucified, risen, and soon coming Savior might be carried to the whole world, how soon might the end come, the end of suffering and sorrow and sin, how soon in place of a possession here with this blight of sin and pain, our children might receive their inheritance where there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now in that one paragraph she uses the word soon four times. One is superlative soon coming, but the others are soon. Now, you know, any time I would say to somebody in one paragraph, soon, and then soon, and then soon, do you think I mean soon? Yes. I think I mean soon. But you know, this was written over 100 years ago. We never listened to the council. That's our problem. That's why we're still here. Do you know that? Yes. We're still here because we never followed the divine council. Yes. We never trained that army of youth. We got into building institutions, but we lost our sense of mission and vision by and large. Today, we are mostly an institutionalized church. We have lost our sense of early primitive godliness and early primitive passion for souls. Amen. You know what Ellen White says in the book Desire of Ages? She says, in comparison with the value of one soul, worlds sink into insignificance. Is that powerful or not? You see, God can make a world out of nothing. Everything will be functioning. He doesn't need seven days. He can do it in a moment, just like that. A fully functioning world with everything running perfectly, but there'll never be another you. There'll never be another you, another, another one of you, another one of your children. All of us are unique. We're designed for eternal fellowship with God. And if you are not in God's kingdom, there will always be an empty spot in his heart for you. We, we, we walk by, by people and we forget the value of a soul. Heaven went bankrupt to save souls. It would have gone bankrupt to save one soul, even to give that opportunity to be saved, whether or not they chose to be saved. Do you know that? Jesus would have died for one. 
but we don't, give, we don't give the time of day to people. We walk by them every day. I hope that now you can begin to pray that God will help you to have mission eyes, that you see vision, a new vision, see the value of every soul. You know, the scripture says so clearly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it's not just the big world. It's so, you can put your name there. For God so loved Sandy that he gave his only begotten son. He would have given him for just you and for me. You know, we sing that song, love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. There's nothing like the love of God. Another song. If we, if we could with each the ocean fill and were the, par, the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a tribe, by, a tribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. God's love for every person on this planet, I don't care who they are, I don't care if they're mentally handicapped, I don't care if they're blind, I don't care if they're crawling on the ground because they have no ability to get around. He loves everyone so much, he would have given his son, Jesus Christ, for anyone. We need to pray for the eyes of God for the lost. There are billions of people on this earth that don't know Jesus, never, never really had an encounter with someone that knows Jesus. Millions, billions. And we sit and be happy in church from week to week, and we forget the value of the soul. Heaven is concerned about souls. I'm going to take you on two, two uh, mission trips combined into one. One was six months. One was supposed to be two months, but it ended up being 11 months. So this is 17 months in Africa in different countries. This is in Kibera slum, the largest slum in Kenya one of the largest slums in Africa. And you know, when I went to Kibera slum, I had some misconceptions that, you know, somehow maybe it was a dangerous place. But you know what? I found wonderful people in Kibera slum. Wonderful Adventist people. This is in the Adventist, this is, in, this is, this is a group of, uh, this is a train that's coming right through Kibera slum. And sometime after I was there, it, it derailed. One of the trains derailed, but fortunately, no one was injured or killed. Look at the pitiful condition there. And I, I believe that Adventists, as a church, we need to be focusing on these kinds of places because if Jesus was here, that's where he would be. Amen. He wouldn't be in Heartland. Amen. He wouldn't be in Washington, D.C., in, in Sitligo. He wouldn't be in some other fancy churches, you know, Pioneer Memorial Church in, in Michigan. He would be in the slums. That's where he would be. Now, it doesn't mean it's not nice to have places like this, but that's not where Jesus would be. Jesus would be there where the greatest needs are. That's where Jesus went. That's where he wants us to go. He's calling us there. Just the other Sunday, I went with some lady, a lady, Sandy, Sandra Richards, down in, uh, in uh, Hampton, Virginia. And she has a ministry that she works with the homeless people there. I went with her to deliver some food to those people. And what a wonderful experience that was. You see, if you go where Jesus is working, you're going to get excited about missions. You're going to get excited. So this is the pastor and his wife that was, it, that was there at the time, Pastor Moses. And you see, his wife had a little business. She would set up and sell, and sell some little fruits and things like that besides the, besides the path where people would go, past, besides the road. Very humble. And beside her was another Adventist lady that would sell some greens. This was the Adventist, one of the Adventist church. This was in a slum pub. This used to be a pub. It's just been converted into a church because they, they really don't want them building new churches and new buildings inside the slum because eventually they wanted to tear down those old things, you see. So this is an old pub that was converted into, the, into, a, into a church. And the same walls and the same, except the ceiling and so on, the same walls were the same as a pub. And that's, this is, you see, it's not the place. It's the spirit in which we bring to, to worship that God looks at. He doesn't care about the place. And they took me to see another pub that they wanted to buy because they wanted to, they were spreading, they were growing. So they wanted to grow an, another pub. There's the nameless pub. And we got a little soft drink there. We didn't drink any of the hard stuff. We just drank, drank a little soft drink. And I don't know for sure if what happened if they were able to buy that, but they wanted to buy that as another place because they had multiple churches there in the slum doing a wonderful work. That's inside the pub that they wanted to make into a church. 
The Seventh-day Adventists have a, a wonderful school there in Kiberislav. It's an elementary school and also a high school or secondary school, Adventist Jeremic Adventist Academy. And we have a lot of supplies that we're going to be sending to different schools in, in, in shipping containers in, in, in short, in shortly in the future. Here's some of the children, beautiful children, many of them from the slum. And being from the slum, they don't have a lot of money, you know, so it's a struggle for that school to survive because they don't have a lot of income coming in because most of the students don't have much to pay. And, and so it's difficult for them to come to, school, to support their school. This building here for the elementary school was built by ADRA Australia. The ADRA Development Agency over in Australia, they funded the building of this building. But you know, it's getting run down and it needs new glass in some of the windows and there's a lot of upkeep. They just don't have the funds to operate properly. This is the secondary school, the high school, and many of these students are Muslims. Some number of these are stu the students in the, in the school are Muslim. Now, I was interested, he took me to see a church. This is up in, in Kenya now, and this is up some distance from Nairobi in an area in, in called Marimanti. I've done outreach in this area more than once with the division uh, president before, 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 he, before he became division president, him and his wife, and it, afterwards they had me come to do some help with TMI, total member involvement, a later year. But here you see the donkey back in the background. This donkey helps to haul the water. And uh, they had the supplies here. They were building uh, a, a, a new church because for 15 years they had met under this tree. Okay, now how many of us would meet for 15 years under a tree and be faithful members? Then they built a very humble mud and stick church that I visited in and preached in. In fact, my, my, uh, my projector, when I was showing video, I mean showing a program, a PowerPoint in there, it burned up because the little generator that they were using was underpowered. So my, my projector began to smoke. It ruined my projector. But uh, I don't care. But here now, here's some, some of the people, the two on the outside, the elder and his wife, and look at the nice basketry that they make. And uh, she, she also made this one here. They make beautiful things. And then in between, in between there, James, he's a young man that's really good with farming and so on. He took training with Wildwood when they came over to, to Africa, and the other gentleman that went around with me. Here's a wonderful ministry called the Everlasting Gospel Bicycle Outreach Ministries. This was started with Pastor Blasius Rugudi and his wife, who's, who's now the president, uh, the, third, the third term president of the uh, East Central Africa Division. He and his wife one day were visiting in their home, up country home near Mankau area, near Marimanti in the Thoraka district in Kenya. And one day there was a knock at the door and they went to the, he went to the door and there were some young people and he had invited them in. I have to, say, to tell you real quickly this story. And uh, they, they came in there after some small talk. They wondered, he asked them what they wanted. They wanted legs. He looked at them, they all had legs. They wanted bicycles because they wanted to be more effective in doing their missionary work. So when they left, his wife said, you know, now I know I've been saving that little money. They'd been saving some little money for maybe a vacation, a holiday or something. And she said, now I know we've been saving this money. And so with that, that seed money that they had, they were able to purchase 20 new bicycles for the Everlasting, bicycle, uh, Everlasting Gospel Bicycle Outreach Ministry. And later when he told me about it one day, when I met him up in General Conference, after I met, went, went to his hotel and he told me this story. I videotaped it on my way back from General Conference. I stopped in Waynesboro, Virginia, and uh, a man there wanted to maybe move down in the area where I was living, down in the southwestern part of Virginia in the mountains. And so after supper, I was going to be talking to them. After supper, I asked him if I could show this little video about the Everlasting Gospel Outreach Ministry. He went into the other room, he came back with a pen, with a pen and, and, and checkbook, he was writing a check, he gave me a check for $8,000. I didn't even stay because I knew God was in this. I got back into the car, loaded my things back, four o'clock in the morning or three o'clock, knocking on Pastor Rugudi's door up in Maryland, gave him the check for $8,000. When we went over there, December, January, we dedicated another 50 bicycles to the Everlasting Gospel Bicycle Outreach Ministry. If you want something exciting in your life, get involved in missions, folks. This is the most exciting thing. If I was to do it over again, I would never be a traditional pastor. I would be involved in full-time training of youth worldwide. I believe that's what God is calling us to in these last days. Now, this is traveling along from South Africa, coming up to uh, Malawi. This is uh, some baobab trees. These are interesting trees. They have water inside of them. If you need water, you can go deep enough in there and drill in there. You can get some water out of it. This is the Zambezi River. You've heard of the mighty Zambezi River. It feeds the Victoria Falls, which is uh, known, known as the smoke that thunders. Some of the beautiful mountains. This is transportation. Now, people will actually ride on top of that thing, too. Okay? It's dangerous because it's heavy. It's already overweight, 
And so it could easily turn over going around some of those corners, but people will actually climb on top of that and hold on because they're so anxious to have some way to don't have to walk someplace. There's some of the dugout canoes down from a bridge that we stopped in. And here's some precious ladies. That's how they make their income, selling sugar cane and sweet potatoes. Now, you know you can't get rich on that because the sweet, the sweet potatoes and the, and, the, and the sugar cane, here you see all this sugar cane where people have chewed it and then they spit out the, old, the, the you know, they, spit, they just get the juice out, you know, they don't swallow the, the inside stuff. They just spit it out. So you see all over the ground here is where people have been eating the sugar cane that they're selling there. But that's the way people make, make money. And in the country of Malawi, many people, most of the people, the poor people, the normal people, they, they live on a dollar a day. How can you, how can you, I don't even know how they, I don't know how they can survive on a dollar a day. But somehow, because they work hard and they, they're careful, they're able to live on a dollar a day. This is a blind school there in, uh, in, uh, in Malawi. And uh, Brother Jimmy Strickland there, he, he took some, uh, some um, musical instruments and a PA, little PA system there for them. And now these blind people were uh, playing with the, with the instruments there. There's Jimmy Strickland with, joint, with uh, Creative Global Relief, a wonderful ministry. I took him to Africa for the first time in 2004. He and another elderly gentleman, 70-year-old gentleman, and Jimmy Strickland. That was my first time to, back to Africa since I came back to the U.S. in January of 1970. This was in July of 2004, so 34 years later. And uh, we went there over to Africa, and he fell in love with Africa. He and his wife started this ministry, Creative Global Relief, and now they've been back to Africa 15 times since 2004. They would have gone this year or had it not been for the, the uh, pandemic, but they'll be going next year. If you get, go to Africa, it's going to get in your blood. In fact, I would be there now if I didn't have to get ready these shipments of containers to Africa. Africa is a wonderful place. This gives you the stats for the... For the um, Blind school at that time, 106 altogether, 32 boys, 32 girls in the one level, 16, 24, 48, 58, a total of 106. Now, a wonderful ministry that they have is these treadle foot pumps. This helps people to be able to grow more, more uh, crops because they can have a way of getting them irrigated by treadle foot pumps. It can pull water up from 23 feet deep and can, then they can spray it out all around the water and, fill, and be able to grow things, maybe get three crops instead of maybe two otherwise. This Pastor Willie Boyd from the Norfolk Church, he loves to go over with Creative Global Relief. And uh, the pastor in the Loazi area where we used to live, he took me to see this elderly pastor. This elderly pastor was over 100 years old and he remembered my father who used to pastor there at Loazi Mission in northern, northern Malawi. At that time when we were there called Nyasaland. Here's a typical way of getting water. You have to, again, run and get it. You don't have running to your house. You have to go get it at a water supply, take it home, and uh, then be able to wash your clothes and do your cooking. This is the camp meeting just down the hill from where we used to live, uh, there at Lawazi Mission in the northern part of Malawi. And you see the nice stage there and uh, plenty of children. There's the pastor in the front porch of the house where we used to live. I have so many memories of this. Uh, it brings back so many memories. I could write a book. I need to write a book on this. And here's an here's a iron. You put the charcoal inside, and you close it down, and then you carefully iron your clothes. Uh, you can also use the, the kind of irons that you put on top of the stove, wood stove, and get them hot. Or you, and we also had there at, at that mission uh, one that had benzene or white gas in it. You could put it in, pump it up, and it would make a fire inside of the, inside of the iron, different ways. And we had a, we had an electric, we had a, um, a motor, motorized um, washing machine, and we had a, 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 a kerosene-operated refrigerator. So we had some luxuries, but they were different. There's some of the beautiful children there. And here's the son of the man who used to take care of our garden, our, our, what we called the garden boy. His name was Shaban. He wasn't a boy. He was a family. He had a family. But here's his son. I met him there, and uh, we, we had a little fellowship together. There's the pastor's wife doing cooking out behind the house. And now, there, now there's Shaban, his grandson, son and grandson, our former cook boy, and I mean, a garden boy and uh, his grandson. His grandson volunteers at the Adventist clinic there, and Mary is the nurse. So we're sending supplies to, to these different missions, and as we speak, they've been making blocks to develop our first training center for skills training in, in, in Africa. 
we're developing that. They're making blocks, cement blocks. And so that in, De in December, when we go over, we'll be building this facility and one also in Nzuzu, where we have the conference office. Here's uh, some balls made from uh, the, the rubber. rubber. And uh, here now is the process of making bricks. They were making bricks to build a new church. And so they, they find a place that has suitable soil, a lot of clay in it. They'll mix it up with water, and then they'll, they'll put it into little forms. And this will be then put into a brick kiln that they, they build it in such a way that they can put wood inside of it. And then they seal it with, with mud on the outside. And it burns for so long, and it hardens that mud so it becomes like you know, permanent, permanent bricks. And so this is a way that they're able to make bricks very cheaply. This is the church that they had there. And this was the foundation of a new church, but they didn't have any money for cement. So uh, Creating Global Relief was able to help them. Now, ladies, I know you, you folks are very, very careful about being very um, discreet and very you know, careful about things. But this is the outhouse. You can wave at your friends from inside. Yeah, outside. And they can, if they look carefully, they can see what's happening inside. So you want to be, you would, hopefully, that they're not too interested in that. But this is the facilities there outside of the church. And you can see that there's plenty of fresh air comes in, but you know, you have to take that in stride. Now, don't let this scare any of you folks, okay? Now, some of you were scared. To, one lady was scared today about staying in a tent. But, but this is, I hope this doesn't scare you. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to inspire you to be involved in mission. And we can always make better facilities. You know, We can build better facilities. This is the outdoor carpentry shop. You know, We're trying to get people who have skills to teach young people the skills that they have so that those young people can then be productive. And this is the type of thing. We'll, we'll find people like this who have professions and that they can be able to teach. And if any of you have some skill, I talked to one man who, who was an elementary school teacher. He's interested in maybe one of your group here, interested in maybe coming over to help us. I talked to uh, other people, another one who was an was a, a English teacher. And so I hope that you'll, you'll sign up on that little white seat sheet. Let me know your interests and let me know what kinds of uh, backgrounds you have so that we can get your involvement. This is a man who's a tailor, this outdoor tailoring. You find tailoring a lot of times provides an income for people. There's people always interested in getting things made. Pastor Willie Boyd again. This is the group down at the union office. At that time, now they've moved it up to Le Long Way, the capital, but the group that was there with Creative Global Relief. Pastor Kuyama, the president of the union there. And this is at Matandani Mission, one of the more remote missions in, in Malawi. Here we have um, a, a group that was with us, and then the, the couple that is second from the right, the lady second from the right, and the man behind her, they're from Roma they, were from, they were from Romania, and Romania Missions was doing a special outreach there in that part of Malawi. My folks actually were, went to this mission sometime after they had come back on permanent return back in the 80s. They went back to Matandani. My dad went to be the farm manager. Beautiful, beautiful area there. And then this is Lakeview. We have Adventist Seminary there and other facilities for training young people in Malawi. And when I was there, I met this couple, Elder and Mrs. Fred Wilson, Fred and Marilyn Wilson. This was his second wife. His first wife had died. But Fred Wilson was overseeing over 60 people in building, and fi and fi building facilities there at this mission. I couldn't believe this man at his age overseeing over 60 people. Come on now. This is amazing. But you know, you're never too old to be involved in God's work. If this is God's work, it's worth sacrificing for. Now, I'm 70 years old, but I hope that as long as I can walk, as long as I can get around, that I'm doing all, I, all that I can for the work of God. This was interesting. They have uh, the Creative, Creative Global Relief has a ministry for children and mostly children, and for helping them with schooling and so on, so on like that. Each year they have a special project where they go back and they take them little gifts and they, they take them from a little outing. Here at this particular year, they went to the parliament there in a long way, the capital of Malawi. This is some of the gifts that they had for the young people wrapped in yellow, in yellow bags there. That is uh, plastic that they can use for the roofing of their homes to help be more secure. This is on Sabbath. Look how crowded that is. And uh, this is still in, under construction. Now, you wouldn't be allowed to meet in that church here because you have to get inspection and everything. But here they were still under construction. You can see the, the pile of gravel, and pile of br bricks inside the church. They're still under construction. But as soon as they can get in there, they're in there and uh, busy meeting. 
This is at Lunjika, a wonderful mission, beautiful facility down, uh, down the mountain there from uh, Mzuzu area. And uh, we met there with uh, some of the students and, and young people, did some training. And this was changing the light bulb. They need a ladder. I'm going to send a ladder over there for, for them so it's more, less dangerous. You see, that's, that's dangerous on top of those chairs like that, trying to change the light bulb. It's inside the church doing some training. That's the beautiful thing about Africa. Here I have difficulty getting the attention of young people, let alone their involvement. But in Africa, I can have hundreds or thousands of young people that are anxious to be involved. Our dream is to recruit, train, equip, mobilize, and empower one million youth across Africa over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Yeah. In the country of Malawi alone, we have over 334,000 young people that we can minister to, but we didn't know that God was going to open the door. The government wants us to do our training program in all of the secondary schools of the nation, 884 schools, approximately 360 students in each school. They want us to do the training program in every school of the nation. Now we're scrambling for people to help us to do that training and to develop the curriculum because we want to develop a four-year curriculum that will actually be part of the official curriculum for the nation. God is opening doors in unique ways that we never even dreamed possible. I thought we might be able to do an afternoon voluntary program where people could come and be a part of a club or something to get training. But now that government, the new, new, new government there in Malawi is anxious to do something for the youth because they have now 70% unemployment among the youth, 70% unemployment. The traditional education program is not working. They need something that is meeting the needs of young people, helping them to develop marketable skills that can be able to support themselves. Rather than come out of school, and most of them can't go on to university, and when they come out of university with a degree, it doesn't mean they'll get a job. Most of them don't get a job when they come out of university. So we have to rethink education and be much more what Ellen White says you should be. Balanced education is the harmonious development of the head, the hand, and the heart. It's not just the head. It's the hand and the heart, too. Those are all part of true education. So these young people on top of the mountain here, I believe, are very, have great potential. I remember the first time that I went to, to uh, this place back in 2004, Lunjika. We had, a, we had a bunch of little Bibles, little New, Gideon New Testaments with, this, with the Psalms in it. We gave it to some of the girls, and they were dancing around. Bible, Bible, B-I-B-L-E, Bible. They were so excited. And some of us have multiple Bibles, and we don't read them. Shame on us. You know, we need to be what? We need to be students of the Word. We need to be filling our minds with the Word of God so that God can use those things that we store in the mind to help us in our battle against the evil one. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what, what? sin against God. You see, God wants us to be men and women of faith, men and women of vision, a part of his closing work. This is there in the office of the principal there at Lunjika. And this is how I travel a lot. I, I, I not say a lot. This is how I travel. Even like this in the back of a vehicle, I travel in every way you can think of. In buses, mini buses, and so on. I don't have my own vehicle. That's one big dream that I have, that one day I'll have my vehicle in Africa that we can accomplish so much more if we have that. Here's again the Romanian mission there with the people from Matandani. I was able to ride back with them. Then this is down in the southern part of the state, of the country, there at uh, it was actually, this was a, a non-Adventist group getting training. I was able to give some training to them, Nazarenes. They were wonderful people. And on my way back up to, to the long way, the capital, I met with the lady there who is the first, the fifth from the left, the kind of reddish hair. She is a paramount chief. She's a chief over the other chiefs. These men and uh, these other men, she has ten chiefs under her. She's the paramount chief. Her father had been the paramount chief, or the chief chief, okay? And when he died, they asked her to become the chief chief. Now, she's a very unique lady. She not only is a paramount chief, but she's also a, a person that works with Forex, which is a, a currency exchange, and she also has her own catering business. She has a wonderful lady, and so she met me there, and I, I had the bus drop me off there, and she met me there, and we were able to meet with the people, and then they took us out to this unique place where they were growing 24 people were working under the leadership of, of an individual. They were working together here in growing cooperatively garlic. What I found the secrets in Africa for, for success in agriculture is water and working together with others. Those are the two secrets for success. We've seen this in, repeatedly in different parts of Africa that those are two 
areas of success. Now, ladies, would you like to be able to carry loads like that? On your head. You know, my neck would break. But these ladies have a necks like you wouldn't believe, and they carry heavy loads on top of their necks like this, and sometimes they can just balance and walk along, you know, and they'll be balancing that thing. I don't know how in the world they do it. Some of you may have heard of Riverside. That is a self-supporting facility, a, a mission there in uh, Zambia. And this is on beautiful grounds on, Zam and, and on Riverside. They have a lifestyle center there, have also a large farming area, and have a training center for young people, much like Heartland. But it's a beautiful facility, not far from the river, as you see. And pretty flowers there growing on the facility, some of the young people there. And I thought this pod, was not this bean pod beautiful? It looks like something autumn time. Beautiful bean, bean pods inside, and there you have the unusual fruit. And when I was uh, in another location, they brought me a nice bunch of fruit when I was in Likasi, Congo. I went to Likasi, Congo to um, help from Zambia to Likasi, Congo to help to hold some evangelistic meetings for Elder Wilson, General Conference President. They wanted him to come because he used to be a missionary there in Congo. But because he couldn't come, the division president asked me if I would hold the meetings. And so we had, we had an opportunity to hold evangelistic meetings there. One of the young ladies uh, uh, that I, and now we're setting up for the evangelistic meetings. We're making a frame to put our uh, cloth on for rear view projection. There's some of the, one of the choirs. They love to sing, they have many choirs. Here's the people baptized, 157 people baptized. Now that wasn't because of just the meetings. They did work beforehand. This was just a harvesting mostly meetings. And then this is the evangelistic meetings. But unfortunately, when the wind would come, it would just tear things up. They'd have to repair again. You know, it was, it was like almost regular times having to repair things that were damaged by the wind because it was in a very open place, a market, open area. But at the end, on the final Sabbath, there was the, the baptism of these individuals. Not the best water, but it was, it still it was done. And then the conference president there presenting the, the um, certificates of baptism. And we also gave each one of them a, a, a Bible in, in their language. While I was there also, I thought it was interesting. I would make friends with the, with the little motor, motorcycle uh, drivers and made friends there with them. And uh, they had this other group. This was a Sabbath-keeping group. They looked like some sort of, uh, of uh, Greek Orthodox or something, but it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a local localized uh, religious group. It's a Sabbath-keeping group. And the morning after our final meetings, I went up to the site to take, down, to take off the, the uh, cloth off of the frames that were used as our projection. And here on the ground, I found a bunch of young people lying on the ground, sleeping. And they were street boys. I'd heard about street boys, but I hadn't met them. And so I became acquainted with these young men, and they were wonderful. The young man, the second from the right, is a 15-year-old boy, and he was like the daddy for the group. He looked after them and, and helped them. And they, I saw such beautiful spirit among these street boys that, that were, you know, we, we should have that kind of a wonderful spirit among us as Christians as well. We bought them a we bought them a, a, a ball. We bought them a, 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 a basin that they could get wash their clothes in because this is where they got their water from a broken pipe. They were able to get water for bathing and for washing their clothes. So we were able to make contact with them. One of the wonderful young people. And in Congo, there's an animal called okapi. It's kind of a, it looks like a cross between a zebra, a zebra and a, 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 a antelope. But it's, it's a, it lives in the forest. An unusual animal, uh, endangered animal. Then back up to Tanzania, another country. Here we have an Adventist school catering to the albinos. In Africa, albinos are sometimes seen as having magical characteristics, and sometimes people will eat them. They, will, they think there's magical things that by eating a, a flesh from an albino or, or organs from an albino, that they'll somehow get some magical things. But of course, that's foolishness. But this school uh, deals with helping the albinos to have a safe place where they're, where they're cared for and where they're educated. We're able to distribute Bibles. We have, again, thousands of Bibles. We're getting ready to, set, to send 6,000 Bibles that were donated from the Review, and 6,000 of these books, the Christian service books, that were donated by the Review before they closed, they were sending over. And then this was a, a more recent uh, trip over to the country of Kenya, went over to help with TMI, Total Member Involvement, and there they were again, they were again, uh, dedicating some new bicycles for the bicycle ministry, even had some ladies involved. But they, I think they need ladies' bicycles for the ladies. They shouldn't have men's bicycles for the ladies. It's difficult to get on and off. So hopefully in the future we can get some ladies' bicycles for them. Some of the young people on the... the now they have an interesting practice there. When they're going to have an event, 
they'll have a big event where they get the attention of the community. So they'll have a parade, they'll have motorcycles, they'll have cars, anything they can do to make a lot of noise and get the people's attention to invite them to come to the evangelistic meetings. This is TMI or total member involvement. And so that's what they were doing. They were trying to involve people. Here you see them parading along on bicycles, on motorcycles, however they can get attention. These are some of the young people that I worked with. I was able to take some, some uh, resources, some, tool, some um, toys and so on to a, a deaf school that they have there in Marimonti. And this is a resource center that we have that we want to develop into a training center for the young people there in, in that in district. This was on the final Sabbath of the TMI program. You can see a full house there, parking lot outside, not, too, not much not much of cars, mostly bicycles or motorcycles. Many people are there, they travel in what we call Legomobile. Have you heard of a Legomobile? Your legs, Legomobile. Most of them travel by Legomobile when they get there. And if you'll notice in the baptism, the big baptism at the end, this was bringing in people from different sites where the TMI, the total member involvement, evangelism had been done. You will notice they're predominantly young people. Notice that. Most of the young people, most of the people being baptized here were young people. As you can see, even in the, the young ladies, they're mostly young, they're mostly young people. This is a wonderful school in Tanzania that we're working on developing. We have uh, seven shelters that have been built by Kibidula, which is another self-supporting facility there in the country of Tanzania. These seven, the seven uh, uh, sites, seven uh, shelters, we hope to develop into a training center that will include trades and skills training for secondary school level. They have, we have uh, 60 acres that the conference had, and then we were able to purchase, to, to, uh, purchase 20 extra acres. So we have 80 acres there now, have a good water source. The water source here is, is about six feet deep. You hit water. It's very, very shallow. Now, it's not the best for drinking. You have to boil it before you can drink it. But it's good for irrigation. It's good for bathing and so on. It's good for other sources than, than just, for, uh, just for drinking. Now, when you go to the store and you buy a coconut, Remember that somebody may have put their life in their hands to get that coconut. You remember, can you imagine climbing to the top of that tree to, to fetch a coconut? It's dangerous. Your life, you could fall from there and die. Now, this was a very interesting. Here we had uh, some training that had been given, a two-week training with Pastor Jeffrey and Buona, the division, one of the, uh, North, the, one of the general conference uh, vice presidents. He's from Tanzania. He had gone over to do training there. He's done it several couple of years now. And this was as a result of the training. He trained people in, uh, to think outside the box, to think on a new level. And then they organized themselves together, one week training, and then another week organizing themselves together, looking at different possibilities. And then they would organize themselves into groups according to their interests. Some went into farming, one group went into welding, one group into, uh, some groups into tailoring and so on. But this, is the, this was in now January, after the training that they got in uh, September. And look at the beautiful things that are being produced in this garden. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is, looks like a professional garden. And they're just doing amazing things. This here was another, another, another farm, 27-acre farm down by the river that a group, mostly of, most of them were jobless before. And uh, now they were producing on a professional level. 27-acre farm with all done by hand, all this work done by hand, and then by irrigating it. Another interesting thing we found right in the, in, the, in the city of Dar es Salaam, a city of 4.5 million people. We were walking along one day near the American embassy, and we noticed these patches of greens that were growing. This young man was there. He told us that he had this patch of greens. He had a patch, and there were nine other people that had patches. What they would do was that they would each plant a little bit different time. So like one plant today, three days later, another would plant. Three days later, another would plant so that they always had fresh greens because they would be growing from seed to harvest in 30 days. What they had to do was to plant them, prepare the ground, plant them, and then they had to water them twice a day, morning and evening, and then give them a little bit of, of, uh, of fertilizer, some chicken manure when they were a little bit high. But what was incredible was 15,000 shillings to rent the ground, ground his lot, 15,000 shillings to pay for the water, had another 15,000 shillings for the seed, and then some little bit, maybe 10,000 shillings for the chicken manure. So let's just say that's 45, 55,000, but he was able to sell this every month. Now listen, able to, able to sell this every month, his patch of greens, sell these greens for 250,000 shillings. I said, what else can you ever 
find that kind of increase. You invest 55,000 and you sell it every month for 250,000. That's five times. And, and so people would come there, they love, this is a type of green that people really love. So you find something, like Kibidula. Kibidula has a, a, a variety of, 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 of avocado that's better than all the other people in the area, and so people like Kibidula, Kibidula uh, avocados. They don't like the other people, they want Kibidula, you see? You need to find something that's unique to you that's better than anybody else has. Shouldn't Christians be having the best to offer to people? We should do that, you see? And these people are doing that, and I said, well, this is wonderful, because this young man, he could, he could go to school, he could have another job, he could hire somebody, or they could take turns rotating around among the ten of them, the ten sites, to take turns in watering it. One, one, one week, one person could water them all, next week another one could do it, you see. There's a ways of doing this thing so that everyone could be productive. There's no reason for anyone in this world to not be productive. I don't care if you're handicapped, we can find ways for you to be able to do something, that God will help you to do something to be productive and contribute rather than to be Someone is just always asking for help. Now in Congo, in, in, in the Kinshasa, Congo, there's a, there's a pastor, a young pastor. He used to be a conference president in North Kivu. And he's doing amazing things with a program that he's called Train Them to Fish. Rather than giving a person a fish, you train them how to be productive. He's doing amazing things. I'm hoping, he, hoping he'll be here after the first of the year. To, uh, to help us to, to promote the needs of Africa. But we want to do a big free medical clinic in, in Kinshasa early next year. So if any of you are in the area of medical field, sign on with that, on that little sheet that I have inside there. Sign on and let me know how it is that you want to be involved and what other things you might be interested in helping us with. Because we need your help. We cannot see one million young people in training by the end of 12 months if we don't have help. But. Each of those young people, when they receive the free training, are going to agree to something. And that is that they're going to tell, share, share with five other people what they learned. Amen. So the end of the second year, we have what? Six million, and then 36 million, then 150 million, you see? It can grow like that if we just have a vision. As it is now, we're thinking inside of a box. We're thinking in a small way, rather than thinking in terms of the big way. And with the technology that we have now, it's amazing what can be done. I don't need an office anymore. All I need is this. I can organize those million young people off of one phone. One phone. Now, I won't do it myself. I'll be like Moses. What did he do? He had people over 10. He had people over 100. You see, that's how you organize yourself. And so that there's, a, there's a connection between the different levels, and everyone can be connected and network together to complete the mission of Christ. You see, our job is to networking the body of Christ to complete the mission of Christ. The mission of Christ is clear. What is it? Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth, universal authority. And then what does he say? Go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations. These are our marching orders. Nothing else qualifies. The marching orders of, our, of the commander in chief is this. What did he say? Say it with me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That's our marching orders. It's clear. It's very concise, but it includes every one of us. If any one of us are unfaithful to those marching orders, he cannot say good and faithful servant when he comes. He'll say, depart from me into what? Everlasting fire. Depart, de prepare for the devil and his angels. That's what he has to say, because it's either we, we have a heart that beats in unison with his heart for the lost, or we're, we're on the other side. There's only two sides that we can be on. It's either Satan's side or God's side. And we must, with God's help, be faithful to the commission that he has given us, or we will miss out on that beautiful future that Jesus has prepared for us. We could be just going through. I want to show you some more pictures here. My, fa my favorite place in Africa is Zanzibar. Zanzibar, 99% pure Muslim but I've never seen a more receptive place in all of my ministry than Zanzibar. I've been there seven times in these few years, last, since 2019. Seven times to Zanzibar. It's a wonderful place. We met with this outreach for Muslim people, by Muslim people, and we learned how to network with them to, to see how we could minister and build relationships. You know, Ellen White says, Christ's method alone will bring true success in reaching the people. What was his method? 
He mingled among men as one who desired their good. He ministered to their needs, showed them sympathy, won their confidence, then he invited them to follow me. We get it all backwards. We say, follow me, follow Jesus, but we haven't done all the homework, and we wonder why people don't, don't become a part of what we're doing. It's because we're not following the simple methods that Jesus left us. She says, Christ's method alone will bring true success. There's no other method that will bring true success. Unfortunately, other methods will bring some measure of success, but not true success. There's only one method that will bring true success. She says, if we would humble ourselves before God, and we were kind, merciful, tenderhearted, and pitiful, these are all action words, there would be 100 conversions to the truth. Conversions, not additions. Conversions to the truth, where now there's but one. In other words, instead of 10, 10 additions to your church, there would be what? A thousand. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine Pentecost happening again in your church? In your community? It can. But we have to follow the method, and we have to follow Jesus. Jesus said, what? I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He will teach you all things. He'll bring into your remembrance the things that I've taught you so that it'll all, be, it'll all gel and make sense. He's anxious to do that. Dear one, it's too late to play the game of church. It's too late to go through the routine that we've always been going through for all of our lives. You see, I came back to this country I came back to this country knowing the needs of Africa in January of 1970. And for 34 years, I did zip to help missions. I did nothing but to tell, tell some stories and to give some offering, nothing of significance. I did not become personally involved. But then our three daughters went from Southern Adventist University to South America to Peru as volunteer missionaries one year. My wife and son and I went down to visit them over the Christmas, New Year's vacation. And I knew it was not a voice, but a strong impression. You must become involved in missions. And so the following July, I started going back to Africa. Since then, I've been back many times. There is nothing like missions to bring life to the church. Without missions, your church is dead. Because it is not obedient to the command of Jesus. You cannot fulfill his mission if you're not doing what he's told you to do. So this is on Zanzibar Island, wonderful place. Oh, that's interesting. Many of the streets are very, very narrow in Stone Town, one of the main towns on the island. Why? Because narrow streets provide more shade. And also, they provide protection for enemy armies coming in because they can't navigate through the streets very well. That's why they're one of the reasons why they had narrow streets. We're working with, look at the beautiful artwork there in this door, that beautiful carving. Working with the the, with the uh, young people with sports, but also there are many health, health, health uh, groups on the island. Outdoor ch- place where they're doing carpentry, visiting one of the places where um, a man was showing us about how they grow coconuts. They poke the coconuts, bury them in the sand like that, and then as they grow, they, they'll be able to grow and transplant them. This is an uh, interesting one there. There you have the that's it, the, that is the plant for, uh, what is that, uh, that uh, vanilla. That's a vanilla plant that they're very expensive, the original vanilla. This was interesting, another, another place there in Dar es Salaam area, Adventist group meeting together with others that were handicapped there trying to help people that are deaf and other needs that people have. Bagamoyo area. This was very interesting. Um, there's a man whose name is John Chagama. He, when he was a child, he was fired from school because his parents couldn't pay 20 shillings. And so he has a burden for the education of young people, and he's developing a training school that will be university as well as trade school where people can come for free, and then they work on his 1,000-acre farm nearby to be able to provide for their education. There's the first part of one of the buildings. He has two lakes that have been built there. They've been dug there. One is deeper there than the, than the uh, harbor there in the, where the ships come in in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Health, health outreach. Wonderful outreach there, uh, Oyster Point. This is traveling up to um, Morogoro area, Kenya, in in Dar es Salaam, um, Tanzania. Beautiful area, beautiful mountains. And then back down to Malawi, where we helped with an eye clinic, free eye clinic in a refugee camp where there's 10,000 people from from six different countries. And uh, we were able to to fit 437 people with, with eyeglasses some eyeglasses that were donated by Lions Club. 
You see, there's something for everyone can do, something everyone can do. This is going to a very remote mission. They wanted me to visit one of the very remote missions. And this is a, this is a dormitory for the girls. They deserve better than that, I believe. They deserve better than that. But they're happy they're in the dormitory. We need to help them to have a better facilities. They have a 27-acre farm there that has a lot of potential with a little vision. School. So you get a picture. But my appeal to you is this. Do something for local missions and global missions. Because the work is not finished anywhere no. until it's finished everywhere. No. It's not finished anywhere until it's finished everywhere. Do all you can. Well, I call it global missions. Global and local is global. Global missions. We need to be involved in missions everywhere because missions is the reason for our existence as a church. There's no other legitimate reason for us to be a Seventh-day Adventist unless we're fulfilling the mission. No other legitimate reason. We're illegitimate if we're not fulfilling the, the commission. Up front here, you can see some of the things that I've collected from different countries, um, some of the beautiful things. This is from Bagamoya, one of the places there, two-colored two wood that's been carved. This is hippo ivory, hippo tusks. Some of these from the Maasai people in Kenya. This is a Maasai warrior, very interesting people, very interesting group. And um, here we have uh, from Ethiopia, some elderly people there from one of the countries. This is from the, the country of Kenya, made out of sisal, which is a, a, natural, a natural fiber, made into a nice uh, purse for women. Some of the other things you can look at it later. But I want to read you these words in closing, this, these thoughts in closing. I love this book. How many have this book? My favorite book when it comes to learning about serving God. If you don't have it, I have six copies with me. I'd be happy to share with you. But uh, some of you, if you want to get them, but read this book. Let me read to you. Christian Service. Christian Service. Best book that I know of. It's a compilation. Wonderful book. Listen to these words. It's, it's a section called Aim for a Heavy Crown. Aim for a Heavy Crown. We, not, we must not become weary or faint-hearted. It would be a terrible loss to barter away enduring glory for ease, convenient, and enjoyment, or for carnal indulgences. A gift from the hand of God awaits the overcomer. Not one of us deserves it. It is gratuitous or generous on his part. Wonderful and glorious will be this gift. But let us remember that one star differs from another star in glory. But as we are urged to strive for this mastery, let us aim in the strength of Jesus for a crown heavy with stars. Now, what does that stars mean? A star in your crown represents a person you've brought to Jesus. You see, there'll be nobody in heaven without at least one star. No one would be in heaven without at least one star because you wouldn't belong there, you see. You wouldn't be lonely. You wouldn't be comfortable there. You wouldn't be happy there. If your heart was not beating in unison with Christ's heart for the lost, you would not be happy in heaven. You'd be chipping off the streets of gold and putting it in your backyard. You, you're not going to be there. You're not going to have anybody that does that, okay? You're going to have people there that are converted, that are, have a passion for souls, and that are using all their energy to win souls for Christ. That's why we're here. And then she says, They that be wise shall shine as the firmament, and they that win many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now, you know, when we sing that song, will there be any stars, any stars in my crown? When at evening the sun goeth down, when I wake with the blessed in those mansions of rest, will there be any stars in my crown? Yeah, there must be at least one, okay? Then, but what's really exciting is this. <laughs> I love this. I mean, I didn't always understand this, but more recently I read this. This is too good to be true. You must read this book. If you do, you, you mark every page. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good because it's inspired. It's different from other books. I have to pick and choose from other books. But this book, I don't have to pick and choose. I know it's all good. Okay? Now, notice this. Why do we not become enthused with the Spirit of Christ? Why are we so little moved by the painful cries of a suffering world? Do we consider our exalted privilege of adding a star to Christ's crown? Can you believe it? 
everyone you bring to Jesus, you put a star in Jesus' crown. <laughs> Can you imagine how exciting it will be? One day, you'll be saying, hey, look, look at that star in Jesus' crown. Look at that one. That's someone I brought, I brought to Jesus. That's why we crown him with many crowns, right? He has so many crowns, you can't, one crown won't fit all the stars because he has many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. It represents all those people that have been saved. How good, how good. And then this. Oh, you know, how much does it pay? How much am I going to get if I take this job serving God? I want to tell you something. Maybe you don't already know it. You've already been paid. I'll read it for you right here. She says, the Lord at his coming will scrutinize every talent. He will demand interest on the capital he has entrusted by his own humiliation and agony, by his life of toil and his death of shame. Now listen now. Christ has paid for the service of all who have taken his name and professed to be his servant. I've already been paid, thank you. You've already been paid. With the infinite, the infinite price. One person said, heaven went bankrupt when Jesus died for us. God gave what he had only one of, his son. Only one son. Now, I have three daughters and one son. But I don't love anybody enough to give my son. I'm sorry. I just am not there yet. But God loved the world so much. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Do we catch the vision? of God's heart. His heart going out over every individual on this planet that is made in his image, made for eternal fellowship. If anyone is ever is, if, is not in his kingdom, there will always be an empty spot in God's heart for that person. That's the kind of love we have. Now you know it's that last story, right? About invitations by royalty are never in decline. When we were at Luazi Mission, between where we lived and in Kata Bay, there was a low-lying area, a very, very swampy-like area. And there was an unusual animal that lived there that the local people called Ufiti. It was the unidentified subspecies of a chimpanzee family, larger than a normal chimpanzee, but smaller than the gorilla. There were no other animals similar to this for 1,500 miles around. How did it get there? Nobody knew, and they still don't know. How did Ufiti get there? Well, my dad, as he would travel back and forth between our mission and Nkata Bay, where we often would get our mail, he would sometimes, he was an avid photo photographer. He loved animals and loved to take animal pictures. He would take pictures. He'd get sent, sent to, he'd be, I can still remember seeing, you know, Ufiti up in the tree, made her nest up in the tree. It was a female. And um, so as he would take pictures, he would, got some very nice pictures. He would even develop and print his own pictures. He had a little lab that he would do with in the house in the sink, in the kitchen sink. And uh, back in here. Well, that's one of my daughters in Africa. I have to call her back. Not my real daughters, but I adopt young people, kind of like help them. So he would take these pictures, and there was a, a game ranger named Ollie Carey, who was the English, oh, come on. How do I feel I'll have to call you back. Call you, I'll call you back later. Call you back. This is Mary Marimbe. I'm bringing her over to the States here to, to visit, to help us raise the awareness of the needs of missions. And so he, he was friends with Ollie Carey, who was the English game ranger in the area. And so together they wrote an article for a wildlife journal. The Queen Mother in England was an avid connoisseur of wildlife. She read the article, and so when she came to, when she was coming to the Kariba Dam, 
to, to, to inaugurate or to dedicate this new dam project in, in, uh, in northern Rhodesia, now called Zambia. She wanted to meet my father. And so when she came to Mzuzu, which was just 17 miles away from the mission, a short time before that to happen, we were traveling in the Yika Plateau, high elevation area in, in, the, in, in northern Malawi. And it was on, a, I think, Sunday morning. We were traveling early on top of the, and it was a narrow road, came to the top of a hill, and we had a head-on collision with another car exactly like ours, 403 Peugeot, same color, same model, looked just like ours, looked like a, running into a, a mirror. Serious accident, totaled the car, my, mother, my brother's arm was broken, didn't have seat belts back then, his arm was broken, my mother was banged up, she was expecting my younger brother at the time, my father was banged up, and so they didn't feel like they were in any position to see the Queen Mother, because they looked like they'd been through the war, you know, they were banged up and stuff, black eye and stuff, like they'd been in a war or fight or something. And so they sent a message to the district commissioner or the governor of the area, letting him know what had happened and that they didn't feel, they wanted to still see her from a distance but not be presented to her. And this is what he said back. He was sorry about the accident, but they needed to understand that invitations by royalty are never declined. <laughs> he would provide a vehicle to pick us up and take us there. They would be there. It was not a choice. And so the day arrived, it was a short distance away, 17 miles. We were there waiting, the Royal Aircraft comes in, and the, and the airport never got more work than it got before that, before or since. That airport was, got more work before the Queen Mother was coming than any other time in its life, I'm sure. So the Royal Aircraft comes in, then the motorcade comes to the place. Us children, we were sitting some distance away, we were not presented, so we were there, but we were not able to be presented. And so then, finally, they, they come down and they have the receiving line, and my mother and father had been told, you know, don't be nervous because you just watch the people in front of you because you know there's a protocol. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to curtsy in a certain way. You're supposed to not extend your hand for your man before the, the, the royalty extends their hand. There's a certain protocol. And they were nervous. But what, what happened was they were the first in line because they had received a personal invitation. They were first in line, had no one to watch. <laughs> what are they gonna do? And so my dad says, you know, at first, when they were so nervous, you know, but when she extended her hand and was so gracious, Mr. Goodwin, when he, when he was introduced to her, and he got to talk to her about the mission work that they were doing short distance away at the Adventist mission and about the animal. She was interested even in going to see the animal. Oh yes, he was happy to go with her if possible, but it didn't work out, of course. Didn't know, no way that you would know that the animal would be there, you know, it wouldn't be, it makes sense. And so it was a highlight of their mission experience. Now, what's interesting to me is this. Invitations by royalty are never declined. But we can say no to Jesus. Is that amazing? <clears throat> this, is, this, is, this is invitation. Matthew chapter 28, I mean, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and of heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, or it means fit, it fits right, and my burden is right, it, it, my burden is light. You can say no to that invitation, did you know that? But I hope you won't. I hope you'll say yes. You'll say yes to that invitation. But with that yes, there then, becomes, there then comes a commission. You've got to tell somebody about that wonderful Savior. It's like that woman at the well, remember? After she had that divine encounter with Jesus and she recognized that he was the Messiah, she had to tell somebody. She goes running into town, come, come, I want you to meet a man who knows all about me, but he still loves me. Could he be the Messiah? And there was something about her that was so different from what she'd ever been before that the whole town comes out. Not only to learn to know Jesus, but to ask him to stay by an extra day to tell them more about his love. That's the way he wants to use us. If you have had an encounter with Jesus, you must, 
you are morally responsible to tell somebody. Your mission is clear. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, Jesus says, to every creature, every man, woman, and child on this planet needs to hear this message of hope before Jesus will come. There's a work to do, and we need these young people involved. Those of us that are older, we need to be in a supportive role. We need to see God's work soon finished so that Jesus will come. There's not a moment to lose. This pandemic has helped me to see there's not a moment to lose. Everything could close up overnight so that we could no longer travel internationally. We could no longer do what now we can do. Now, as Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night's coming, folks. This isn't to inspire fear, but it's to, it's to inspire a sense of urgency. We have no time, not a moment to lose. In playing the game of religion, no. This is serious life and death issues Amen. we're involved with. So those of you that have sensed God speaking to you today, those of you that have heard the invitation of Jesus to come unto him, and he will give you rest. Those of you that want to respond and say, yes, Lord, I want to make myself available. That's all he asks. He doesn't say you have to get special degrees or special education or special, in special experience. He just says, I'll make yourself available. I'll use you. You see, human effort combined with divine power becomes omnipotent, Ellen White says. There's nothing to fear. We're, tr we're plugging into the source of universal power. All power, Jesus said. All authority. Those of you that would like to respond to this invitation of Jesus today, to come unto him, and he'll give you rest. Those of you that want to say, I want to make myself available to however you want to use me, I'd like you to stand where you are. Would you? Just stand where you are as we close this prayer. And please take time to fill in this little brochure, the little insert of the brochure, so that we can know how we can use your talents and gifts. I can use anybody with any talent to help in finishing this work that God's given us to do. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you're so good, you're so gracious to want to use us as sinful human beings to be your ambassadors to a dying world. Lord, please take us and make us into what you want us to be. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the love of Jesus that we will see in every person someone to share your love with. Forgive us, Lord, for being focused on other things that were not eternally important. And may we focus on what is most important, the winning of souls for your kingdom. When Jesus comes, we know that you're going to basically ask us two questions. You're going to say, where's your family? And then you're going to say, who else did you invite to come? That's the basic what it's all about. It's not so much about all the theory and all the doctrinal things, there may be a lot of things we don't under, even understand fully, but those two things are critical. Where's your family, and who else did you invite? Lord, we want to have a lot of people that we've invited. They, of course, they have to make the choice. We want to see them in your kingdom, Lord. May we just invest ourselves, as Jesus did, unselfishly living a life of service and ministry, so that one day soon, when we stand before your smiling face, we'll hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. And may it be our wonderful privilege then to be your personal ambassadors to the universe telling the story of how you have worked in our lives, how you've had mercy on us, and how you've saved us in your kingdom. May the day be soon when we can stand with you on the sea of glass and sing that song of Moses and of the Lamb, a song of victory, the victory that Jesus accomplished on the cross. May that day be soon. Now bless us as we continue through the hours of the Sabbath and enjoy this wonderful fellowship. Keep us in your will until we face a face-to-face -face communion with you in heaven one day soon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now in closing, I want you to sing a little song with me. I'm not a very good singer. You sit down, you sit down. It goes like this. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. 
with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Now just change it to missionary. Lord, pre.